they all great. Yeah. And even though there are not very many of us here, I know there's a lot of people online. Um, and I think David is going to translate if people online have, have questions. Um, and um, I still think it's nicer that, that we're here together than doing the entirety of this over Zoom. Um, before I start, I want to acknowledge that we are standing on the unceded ancestral lands of the Chagwai Yavitam, the people of Chagwayanga, whose present day descendants are citizens of the Fernandinho Tatavian Band of Mission Indians. They have been here for millennia before we came and will forever call this place home. Historical Tatavian territory encompasses the Santa Cruz Valley. San Fernando Valley, Simi Valley, and Antelope Valley, nearly a third of Los Angeles County. The name Tatavium comes from a Serrano word meaning people facing the sun. I, just, I read uh, today, because I'm, I'm always researching, that the Tatavium language itself is lost. So the word Tatavium is not a Tatavium word, wow. it's a Serrano word. Um, it was lost about 100 years ago, the last speaker was gone. Um, as a federally and recognized tribe, the Fernandina Tatavium received no legal protections and have no legal standing to litigate for recovery of their lands. Fernandina Tatavium Band, the, the Fernandina Band, survived the California genocide from 1846 to 1873 when California's Native American population plunged from a, approximately 150,000 to 30,000, killing four out of five indigenous inhabitants. Okay. Though these are a few simple words and ordinary numbers, they represent our commitment to correct the practices and stories that have systemically destroyed indigenous history and culture. Tonight we're here to welcome Aida Salazar, who is a graduate of our MFA program. Um, who sprang from performative, radical feminist hybrid poetics to become a celebrated children's book author, all of whose work orbits around the twin poles of identity and social justice, as well as the twin genre of the novel and verse. Aida was born in Mexico and grew up in a family of seven children in Southeast Los Angeles, where she spent many days, this is from your website, sitting in little puddles of water on cement, believing she was in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Her first novel, The Moon Within, um, was is the first middle grade work to center on menstruation since Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, 50 years ago. <laughs> and was followed by The Land of Cranes. Both of these books got a huge number of awards. I'm not going to list them. Um, a story about a little girl and her pregnant mother who are caged in an immigrant detention facility. Other works include the picture book anthology In the Spirit of a Dream, 13 Stories of Immigrants of Color. A forthcoming picture book, right, sitting right there, it's beautiful illustrations, Jovita wore pants, the story of a Mexican freedom fighter based on the life of her great aunt, Jovita Valovinos. And there's an anthology that's also up there coming out next year that she's edited uh, called, entitled Calling the Moon, Period Stories, Period as in Menstrual Period by BIPOC authors. In reading Aida's work, we have been talking about incredibly deft handling of potentially traumatic material in a way that combines her commitment to activism with an attention to language and narrative, balancing an obligation to uncomfortable truths with the need for healing. We're here tonight to celebrate um, and hear her read from her just published book, A Seed in the Sun, a historical novel in verse about the daughter of farm workers in Delano, California, um, who has lost her voice and finds it both in the intersection of her intense longing to be a performer and her the inspiration of labor organizer Dolores Cuerta during the pivotal moments of the 1965 United Farm Workers Great Boycott half a century ago and no more than 100 miles north of where we stand tonight. Please welcome Aida Salazar. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. 
for, for inviting me, for pulling me out of the archive, <laughs> the CalArts archive, and having me here. Your thesis is up there somewhere. You know. Is it really? Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, th thank you um, all for being here, and I was very happy to share some time and space with some of you earlier today to talk about my work. So, um, I wanted to give a little bit of a backstory of who I am. I'm gave a great, great. Um, you can unmask if you want. Oh, right. That's right. Thank you. I'm all sweaty. <laughs> all sweaty in here. Okay, um, let's see, where's my... So this is, this is me, um, you can see that I'm here, it's kind of washed out, but that, that's me um, in the 70s, um, and that's my family. I was, I was born in Mexico, um, I was brought over with my family with the, the top four, mm -hmm. uh, like her, him, her. And me, we we were we were little when we came over with my mom and dad. And then when this little girl was born here in the United States, we became uh, we were able to apply for citizenship. But for the most of the most of the time in my childhood, I was undocumented along with my family. And um, you know, we came on a, a visa and outstayed our visa. And, 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 um, but that really informed who I was. Of course, I was in a very loving, very tight family, but um, the ideas of community were really rooted in in um, otherness and in not totally belonging. And um, and you know, my mom and dad, um, my mom had a third grade education, and my father had um, a, a high school education. And so the practice of reading and writing were not something that were that was, you know, big in our family almost at all. Um, but what was big in our family was this idea of um, of storytelling, mm -hmm. of dichos. The dichos are like sayings and tongue twisters and jokes, and and you know, we learned from one another in, in that way. And and it, of course, it was in Spanish and English, and it was all kind of like beautifully. Um, you know, creating an orchestra within my, my writer's brain and, you know, why I would dream so much when I was little. Um, but, so when I was in fifth grade, I had this remarkable teacher. His name is um, Mr. Clark. I don't know what happened to Mr. Clark, but when, when he first gave me a novel to read, I was shocked you know like nobody had ever said here take this book home and read it and and it was kind of like a, a bizarre um a bizarre book it was about a little girl who wants to be a writer it's called daddy long legs and i, I don't know if you, you ever heard this, this story but anyway um he gave me another and then another and another and another and i just just loved began my love with story with novels and at the end of the fifth grade, I did so well in his class that he gave me two things, and I'll show you what he gave me. He gave me two things. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know, isn't that special? Wow. So he gave me my first book that I ever owned, which I still own. Um, it, it still says, this book belongs to Aida Salazar. There's no, the cover isn't there anymore, of course, but the, the hard cover is there. And, and he gave me a Parker pen. And, wow. and that was really the beginning of my consciousness as a writer of who, who I could be. Um, but it really wasn't until um, I, was in the, I was 18, first year of college at UC Santa Barbara, and I went to this class. Um, it was a Latino literature class, and I saw myself reflected for the first time in literature. I had never before seen my stories, my community stories reflected in, and it was, you know, because of Elena Maria Vidamontes, Lourdes Juanaya, Sandra Cisneros, um, and, and, and so on. And it really was very impactful. But at that moment, I went like, wait a minute, 
You mean all the things and the bad poetry and whatnot that I've been writing with my Parker pen all through school? They have merit and they can actually be inside a book. And so that when I was about 18, 19, that's when I decided I wanted to be a writer. I didn't know how I was going to do it because nobody in my family had ever known a writer. I'd never even imagined that. And so, um, um, but I, I kept at it. And I came here to CalArts when I was um, I was 25 or something. And 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 it took me from 1999 when I graduated to 2019 to publish my first book. And um, it's, it's a long road. It's a long road. And um, but this is my work now. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm really proud that boom within the first the first book and it's been uh, thankfully translated to Spanish and English and as has Land of the Cranes and all those stickers are um, you know awards and I'm so humbled that the the community outside of my own community has has appreciated the work um, for for whatever <laughs> whatever merit but but I really am um, grateful for those awards um, and a seed in the sun which is what I'm going to talk about today and then uh, hoping that work camp is coming um, and in the spirit of the dream uh, is, is a collaboration and see the ones at the bottom are all actual collaborations the ones on top I wrote um, the, the one at the, at the bottom um, are collaborations is so these these two are um, translations from span from English to Spanish, and this one here is a translation from Spanish to English, and that's a novel, and uh, by a Colombian writer, which is really really interesting, and it was published in a, in a dual um, mm -hmm. edition, so you know you turn it around, it's in Spanish, and and, and you flip it around, and it's in English. And, um, yeah, that was that book was voted like uh, one of the best. Books of the Year by the New York Times um, last year when it came out, so it's really, really, really cool. Um, and um, you know, it's been a challenge. It, it, I'm new as a translator, and but but so um, thrilled that all I've never studied Spanish formally, but all of the things that I, um, all of the stories and all of the language that I've acquired, the Spanish <laughs> that I've acquired has has been because of my family and that that root that I have. Um, there and these over here are I did an essay in in this anthology about allyship and in this one a short story and this one is the first queer anthology for middle grades and like and it's, it's groundbreaking and so I'm so happy to have a, a short story in verse in that and I've got more more stuff coming down the pike I've got like um, um, a series of board books imagine like baby like age zero to five <laughs> I know the board books are coming um, based on nature and and then I've got um, an, another anthology that I'm editing on a collection of short stories in verse um, by Latine community that that's coming called sing me a story and it's all based around music and um, and then I'm writing currently uh, another novel in verse called Ultraviolet. And um, and then that's all about toxic masculinity for middle grades. And so I'm really excited about all the things that I've got um, coming down the pipe. And and this is a seed in the sun. And as he uh, Matias so beautifully described, it's a, a story about a little girl in a farm working town who's lost her voice and is um, is going to um, try and find it within the movement of, of the 1965 Delano Grape Strike. So I'm going to read to you a little bit of, of what I do when I present to children is totally different than what I do when I present to adults. So I'm going to read from um, things that I could read to, to adults more, more so than to children. I mean, all of it is meant for children, but, <laughs> but, but the way I read is a little bit different. And remember that this is a 12-year-old um, a protagonist. So, and the, the book is, is partitioned into different, the different cycles of the seed. So 
and, and in Spanish, semilla is the seed, and then it goes to blood and bloom. And, and um, it op and the part openers have a quote, and the entitled the entire book was inspired by this quote. They tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. The Mexican problem. Remolino. I sometimes think about how I lost my voice. I could have buried it in the earth, in a surco, the long row of dry dirt where we planted onion bulbs last spring, while the heat of a too hot California day fell on our arched backs like barrels of sun. It could have happened when Papa screamed for me to work faster, just as I was singing along to Mama's songs, louder than Papa's angry words or the drone of planes spraying the fields overhead. It could have been taken by the roaring remolino that slammed into us like the storm of Papa's belt when we upset him, an out-of-nowhere tornado ripping through the fields. Maybe that's when the dirt-drenched air pulled my voice out of my breath and caught it in the spin of wild wind. What's left is a whispery wrap, an orange-yellow mist that comes and goes like clouds. My real voice is either somewhere in the tumble of dirt in the onion fields of the Imperial Valley or was taken by the anger of the wind. One day, I pray it comes back. <clears throat> so Lula's mom is this very important character in, in the book, and she's sick. Um, but she is the one that imparts all of this kind of unspoken indigenous, Mexican indigenous wisdom to her. And, and this is the moment she tells her about seeds. Mama once told me about the magic of seeds. Seeds hold power in their tiny bodies, each grain, each kernel, each bulb, a miracle of life. If given the right soil, enough water, enough light, go buried. A seed will rise with its growing limbs to touch the sun. Mama said, seeds hold the memory of others that came before them, a destiny to become something else, larger, greater, and richer than they once were. They are meant to give new seeds, carrying their miracle inside from beginning to end. Like you, Milulita, and all of God's children on earth, Mama said. So Lula's family are strike breakers. They're they're scabs. The Filipino workers have gone on strike, and and they are taking the Filipino workers places. So they're scabs, and um, this is a moment where they're out on the fields and um, the Filipino workers are striking and um, and she and her sister are, are picking grapes. Seed shot. Soon after, Concha and me, Concha's her sister, have left Papa and Rafa, her father and brother, a few rows behind us and are, are now close to the strikers again. El mayordomo is gone, and the striker shouts, kick back up, but this time they are even more directed at us. I keep my head in my work and try not to make eye contact. Could one of them be Lenore's dad or her tito to Lenore's or Duchess? I stack three full wood crates of grapes onto others. Come on out! We need your help! The strikers won fair wages in Coachella only a few months ago when we all went on strike. We can do it again, but we can't do this without you. Suddenly, a green pickup kicks up a cloud of dust behind it. It comes closer until it stops. Six grow growers get out of the truck, holding shotguns. I know they're growers by their white skin and blonde hair, by the like new collared shirts, jeans, and good boots they wear. Through suffocating heat, they shout, Pack it up, Flint! Get on out of here! The strikers shout back in a chorus, Fair wages for fair labor! El Mayordomo stands beside the growers, his bosses, seeing as he couldn't get rid of the strikers, he must have gone to get them. 
The growers and his mayordomo lift their shotguns and point them at the strikers. And shivers of fear move up the ladder of my spine. Concha suddenly grabs my forearm and pulls me down in and into the thicket of grapevines to hide. The growers shout intensify. You're trespassing, go on, get! And the strikers shout get louder as they get closer to the growers. Give us fair wages, strike, strike, strike. Then suddenly the oldest looking grower shouts, I said get off my property. He shoots his shotgun twice into the air. Screams surround me. I can't move. The Filipino strikers run to their cars and pull out shotguns of their own. They stand together holding their guns across their chest with their heads held high. Their eyes locked cold on the growers. They don't look afraid. Then suddenly, some of the field workers run into the surcos. On that movement, growers and strikers start shooting their shotguns into the air. The gunshots are so loud, I cover my ears and collapse, curling into a ball. I feel Goncha drape herself over my body and hug me tightly. It's okay, it's okay, I hear her say. Goncha, I cry and squeeze my eyes shut. Te tengo, Lula, te tengo. And then it is so silent, the birds no longer sing. Mm. <clears throat> So she has a, a, a father who is, um, uh, you know, has a drinking problem, is very macho, has really um, demanded that she be in, um, uh, you know, be at, not go to school, be on the fields, or not go on the picket, and he's just blocked her every step of the way, um, and and she has finally. Um, gotten the chance to be with El Teatro Campesino, the theater um, troupe of the farm workers, and, and, and things are, are really looking up for him. But but um, um, this is the moment when um, um, her the, their mother has kind of taken a turn for the worse, and because she's got pest, pesticide poisoning, she's taken a turn for the worse, and he's decided to leave, to stop. Um, supporting the union and and being a scab again. Around our table. We sit for dinner around our table like a tightly wound leaf before it unfurls. Papa is more serious than we've seen him lately, though he still isn't drinking. We can't help talk about the strike's troubles. So what are we going to do now that the people are leaving the strike? Rafa asks her brother. The leadership is forming a plan. They want to they want to get through the end of February into the spring when the growers will need us again to lay on the biggest pressure, Baba said. His worries speak loudly on his face. I'm so thankful Concha helped us find this house. We have a nice warm heater, Mama says, trying to lighten the mood. When she graduates college, she'll move us all to an even better one than this, I say, suddenly realizing I probably shouldn't have. I should say also that he doesn't want his eldest daughter, Forcha, to go to college. And he doesn't want his, his son to be a nurse hmm. for, the, for the union. I wince a bit, and when I open my eyes, Papa is going from me to Concha, from Concha to Mama, looking for meaning. No me digas that you still have those pipe dreams filling your head, Concha, and you're telling them to your sister? Papa's voice rises. Papa, Rafa interrupts. It's not what you think. It's only a silly schoolgirl dream. Concha's not going anywhere. But then he says to me through gritted teeth, I need a big mouth. <laughs> I'm not a big mouth for telling the truth, I yell at him. <laughs> Wait a minute. What truth? What do you know that I don't, Rafa? Concha? Papa pushes for us, us for answers. Concha glares at me, then puts her hands on the table and calmly says, I apply to 10 different colleges. The room is thick with silence, and there's, and there's more, Papa, Concha says. 
Rafan looks at Concha, shakes his head, telling her to stop talking, but Concha continues. Rafa is now, and Rafa jumps in. I'm now a nurse's apprentice at the clinic. He beats her to it and purses his lips at us, and th then he says, and Lula is being a metiche at the Teatro Campesino. <laughs> I am so mad at Rafa, but madder at the uh, just yeah, go ahead and uh, cap your... Just a little intermission. Just I'm one sorry. Just, uh, just one. Just one. Uh -huh. Out. In. And this, that should do the trick. Uh, okay. Just we, just, okay. We just... I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not that one. You translate it. Okay. Can you do it? Can you just do it? Press that. Press that. Press that. Press that. It was coming, I knew it. Was. No, well, um, I just, okay, all right. That was suspense for us. I think, yeah. And Lula's being a teacher. She's being a teacher with the Teatro Campesino. I'm so mad at Rafa, but mad at Rafa for making it so we have to hide. I fling Baba's contradictions at him. Why should we keep from doing what we love because you say so, Baba? How can we be fighting for justice for our people when there is no justice in our own family? <laughs> Thrashing leaves. Baba's hurt feelings hurl around the room like leaves caught in wicked Santa wind. He bangs on the table with one of his fists. The impact makes us jump. You are all my criado. How dare you take liberties like that? College is no place for a farm worker's daughter. He points at Concha and then thuds his chest with an open palm and says, my son will not do a woman's job. Then he turns to me and says, and you, Esquinkla, that troop is for men. Yatro is no place for decent women. Pero papá, Concha begins to reason, but papá lands his open hand on the table. Viejo, basta! Mama's voice breaks the reverberation. Our children don't deserve this. They are trying to be of service. These are the things that make them happy. They want, my mom pauses, I want them to find their own path. With one quick movement, Papa unbuckles and removes his belt, making it flap against itself like a whip. Babies, the babies wail at the sound. Mama puts her arms to his chest and pleads, Por favor, no! but he slides her arm away with the back of his arm. There will be no college. He smacks the table with his belt, then says, no clinic, and slaps it again, and then says, and no teatro. With one final smack he heaves, he's hit the table so hard. Aquí mando yo, and I decide how you live your lives. His fury sends us into silence. I am relieved he wasn't drunk and didn't turn the belt on us. Papa walks out of the room, a tornado lifting up every field, tree and leaf, and imploding on itself. Dried leaves turn into a fog of soot, so thick it crashes against our dream. of inspiration and a lot of research that went into the making of this book and primarily it was Dolores Huerta. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my editor, um, Nancy Mercado at Penguin, reached out to me. I, she wasn't my editor at the time, but she, she reached out to me and because of my past work and my activism in children's literature, she, um, she said, you know, I was just at Dolores Huerta's 90th birthday and I realized that there isn't a book about the 1965 uh, Delano Grape Strike or the beginnings of the United Farm Workers Union or Dolores Huerta in middle grade, would you be interested in, in writing it? And I was like, yeah, okay. I mean, I never thought about that, but awesome, okay. And so she did, she, she gave me, um, so she, and I said, let me, let me sit with this for a little bit and see if I can come up with a story. So I started researching, of course, I would watch the Lovers What That documentary and just like went, like just started to research as much as I could online. It was the middle of the pandemic, so I couldn't really go anywhere. <laughs> and um, and um, I, um, and two weeks into it, 
in what's kind of been become a custom. And I recently dis discovered that, or, or learned that that this is when your brain is actually at its alpha wavelength or peaks when you're coming out of sleep. The moment when you're coming out of sleep and you know, between sleep and waking, that's when your brain is the most creative. And that's exactly when I write. Mm -hmm. Like that's when a lot of my ideas come, and that's what happened. At that moment, two weeks into the research, Lula's voice came to me and I shot up out of bed and I started writing and I wrote the first like eight pages of the story. Mm. And and the process was a little bit different because I wrote it in prose. I wrote 30,000 words in prose and I couldn't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> drama and the performative aspects of, of, of poetry, um, or narrative poetry. And so um, my husband said, why don't you start writing it from poetry from this moment forward? And I was like, uh, okay, let me try. And so I tried, but I was like, there's no song, no, this isn't right. So I scrapped the whole thing. And I threw it away and I started from the beginning in verse and, and here we are. And this is kind of, you know, it, it's an experiment. It just kept you know, becoming a hybrid and hybrid and hybrid, and it, it, it was, it's fun, it's really fun. So this is Solo Dispuesta, and and um, earlier in the class, we, we read, um, I read a, a passage of the moment where a little, where little girl sees Solo Dispuesta, and she's, she's doing this, she's holding this, this, um, this sign, um, Huerta, which is an iconic photo of her. Um, and the other, you know, thing that I wanted to do is like, well, I couldn't, I knew that Dolores Suerta had a biographer. I wasn't wanting to write Dolores Suerta's story. I wanted to uh, write a story set during that time and to highlight uh, Dolores Suerta and the women's and children's contributions and the Filipino strikers as well. And I will, and because this is somewhat of my shtick is that uh, using the arts as a tool for social change is so big and it's such a, um, foundation of my work in general that I wanted to show how the farm workers use theater as as one of the most important organizing tools and they literally were on you know dirt floors you know creating and enticing people to come and join the theater um, and and at the beginning it was just men and that's what the story kind of focuses on that she's not able to enter because she's a girl and, and a kid on top of that. And um, um, but here is one image that that shows children involved in a theater company. Another kind of important um, element is is my my own family story of farm work. That man there is my grandfather, Chema Viramontes, and my grandmother, Este Cuca Viramontes, and that's my mother. They were part of something called the Bracero program, which which hired during World War II, there was a labor shortage, and they there was a program between the United States and Mexico where they would bring workers from Mexico and they would um, you know, they would fill the spaces that that were left during the war by American workers. And so and, and they were here with permission. And the Braceros um, obviously worked the field and my grandfather did too. My grandfather was in Texas, in McAllen, Texas, on the back of the bed of a truck with other farm workers, and they were on their way out to um, to pick the field. And um, the back of the bed of the truck unhinged, and and the men went flying. Mm -hmm. And when my father grandfather landed, he you know could no longer feel his his feet or legs from waist down, still waist down. So he broke, he broke his back. When he was hospitalized, and my mom was in school while my my grandfather was a bracero. And when um, but when he he was um, he was put in the hospital, she started working the field. So that that little girl is five years old. Mm -hmm. And um, and this is still happening today. This is, these are children in, 
in 2022 who are picking the field, um, you know, struggling to go to school. And, and so the ideas that this is history is, is kind of absurd, you know, like it, it's still happening. And, and uh, the United States has child labor laws, but but the only industry in the entire nation that does not abide by child labor, labor laws is farm work. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most dangerous professions there is. It's got a very high mortality rate because of heat stroke, because of um, chemicals. And, chemicals and children, children and women are especially um, prone because of sexual violence that happens against them on, on the field. And these are, this is a modern day great picture. The technology has not changed. This is the same as, you know, 1965. But that's not what it's worth that today. <laughs> and uh, she's still fighting. Um, they just did a march to from Delano to um, Sacramento to, again, to fight for the union, uh, for people to be able to vote, to unionize at their, in their own homes and not be intimidated by growers. So now there was a bill that was passed, AD 2183. And, um, and the woman to the left of her is Teresa Romero. So, you know, everybody's heard of Cesar Chavez. Fewer people have heard of Dolores Huerta, but they've co-founded the, the farm, workers with, farm Workers Union with Larry Itzion. And Dolores Huerta was never voted as a president, even after Cesar Chavez died, because of sexism. Mm -hmm. And um, and a man named Marcos Rodriguez um, uh, uh, was was voted in. And Teresa is the first female president of USW, so something's changed. But not, and that's and that's really great. Let's see. Okay. Oh. Oh. No, that, that's for children. <laughs> and that's it, I think. Yeah. yeah. If you have any questions, I'm, I'd be happy to take them. I have many questions, actually, okay. <laughs> but I'm only going to have one. I know that some of you have had a chance already to, to be in conversation, but um, thank you so much, first of all, and what a wonderful sort of reading that you did. It reminded me also of being a kid, and maybe if you were lucky enough to have a really great librarian, a really great teacher who would do the voices yeah. and do it, so thank you. Um, I'm interested to know about the novel and verse as a genre. Mm -hmm. I know it's become so popular, mm -hmm. especially it seems like for middle-aged readers or even for kind of older YA readers. What can you say about that kind of hybrid form? We started talking about it a little bit, mm -hmm. but why the novel and verse? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I, we were talking about this earlier in. When I was at CalArts, I read Anne Parsons' autobiography yeah. of Red, mm -hmm. and that was the first novel in verse um, that I read, and that kind of planted the seed. It was just kind of the, the style that I wanted to emulate at some point. I didn't know I was there yet. But, but then when I became a mother and I read with my children copious amounts of children's literature, I found um, this, well, we read together with my children this book called The, the Red Pencil by Andrea Davis Pinkney. And, and it's about a little girl in Sudan and um, who, who's a, she's in a refugee camp and it's all told in verse. And when I read that book, I was like, that's my shit. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, you know, because, you know, at CalArts, I was kind of leaning towards this hybrid form. I was really kind of trying to write poetry and essay and and <clears throat> fiction and nonfiction. And so it was just this um, but but um, but when I saw it so clear for children, that's when I knew that, that that I wanted to do it. And back then that was like 2017 when I read that and um, there were very few. Now Andrea Davis Pinkney is a very well known author in the children's book world. 
She's also a big editor at Scholastic. I think she's the vice president, um, also a black woman, mm -hmm. which is very rare uh, in, in publishing. And so, um, you know, she was a big, that was a big inspiration to me. But um, the form just really speaks to, um, to my sensibility as a poet, but also um, allows you to still be a, a storyteller, mm -hmm. which to me is really, um, you know, important. You know, I, I'm a big fan of lyric poetry, right? Like these, just these little slices of life. You know, these are those are important, but but I, I feel like poetry is is a very compelling way to communicate almost anything, but like story in particular, because it has these deeper layers and things that you can do with the line, um, the musicality, you know, there's the music of the line, the, the imagery, the, the figurative language, all of these different things that you can kind of bring to, to um, a verse novel, to, to a telling of a story in a way that you, you really can't. Well, I mean, you can, but 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 not in the same way. And when, and when an economy, right? Like economy is a really beautiful tool of of the, the this hybrid form form because you have less real estate. We were talking about how much less time and space you have to to, to tell what you've got to tell, and and it kind of cuts away the fluff, you know? Like it really does. And um, just really enjoy it. I enjoy the the. Form. But I will say in so in in when I was when I was shopping around the moon within my first book in verse I had like three rejections from people who were like this is lovely but I have no idea how to sell this mm -hmm. so the market has definitely changed I think like um, so it sold in twenty eighteen and um, and in I think in twenty yeah, I think 2018, that's when the Poet X, the Poet X yeah. came out. And also, right before that, um, some, a book called The Crossover by Kwame uh -huh. Alexander also became, won the Newbery Award, which is the highest you know, honor in children's literature. And um, yeah, so those two books, I think, really made it so that people kind of perked their ears. There's a problem, though, however. <laughs> There's a problem that now, Anybody thinks mm -hmm. they can write a full novel verse, and and they're not well done. And I I can't tell you how many books, novels, and verse they get sent to me for blurbs, and I'm like, I can't put my name behind this. These people did no work. Mm -hmm. They didn't do any work, you know. So, um, you know, you can't break the line and think that you're writing poetry. Mm -hmm. That's not enough. It, it's not enough to be economical. Like there's way more more that you can do with poetry, um, that that you know that people are just not doing. And 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 the problem is the further problem is that people who don't know this are the ones get, like allowing these books to be published. Yeah, and and you know your common reader will go like, oh, that's it's fine, but they don't know the heights to which you can take. A, a, a poem, so 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 it's a little bit of a problem now that it's so popular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I've, I've got a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, when you start a project, do you have an age range in mind that you are writing for or to middle grade versus children's lit, or is that something that you leave to the, the discretion of the publisher? No, I um, well, it's been a, it's been a little combination of both. Just because um, as my work's gone out there, I've had publishers come to me now, like the board book. I never thought I was going to write a board book series, but they're like, just bring what you do to in middle grades to board books. Um, so there's been a little bit, and like the editor who came to me, but um, but but mostly they're they're stories that I want to tell that I feel are missing. Um, uh, yeah, and so yeah, mostly it's that, but but then there is a little bit of the other. Yeah, like the the anthology, like editing these two anthologies, the short stories in verse and this one. I feel like there's there there are holes in the market. There are things that we need to fill as as you know communities of color in particular that that need um, that need 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 space and time and voice and so. 
Are there questions from the chat? Is that what yes. you're Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> I've got three like, pending. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, is there any way as a consumer of produce that you can be supportive of farm workers instead of supporting industries that exploit them? Well, buying organic, and then there is such a thing as UFW certified farms. So like if you can get a CSA box, if you do that sort of thing, a CSA box from a, from UFW um, uh, certified um, uh, farms, that, that's one way. It's hard, it's hard. But but buying organic, definitely. Because yes. Because organic because oh because it's much better for the farm workers. Yeah, right? yeah. they're not exposed to all the chemicals. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But it doesn't it doesn't necessarily like typically um, farms that are organic. Um, you know, they even organic is kind of political because they have to go through all these um, hoops to to certify as organic, but but um but there's more of a consciousness yeah yeah you can go to the ufw website and find farms that um support next question i have <laughs> uh, could you also speak a bit about how publishers determine the age range for a book and mm -hmm. if there was ever a time where you did not agree with the one they ascribed your work well no those lines are kind of definitive um they're they don't make sense <laughs> necessarily because, yeah, they just don't. So, okay, so for board books, zero to four or five. Picture books, which is like that one, that's ages five to about 10. And and then um, uh, there's something called chapter books. Mm -hmm. And chapter books is from like first grade, which is like seven to about third grade, very small um, window there. And, and some some fifth graders, yes. And then and then middle grade, which is what I mostly operate in, um, that's ages eight to twelve. And then young adult, thirteen through eighteen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it doesn't make sense because developmentally the the, the difference between ages eight and thirteen are just like so huge, and, and so there's arguments out there for people to do like a, a younger young adult, so like ages you know 12 to 14, like that is its own age, and and um, so there are some writers like myself, like Simone Within is writing in that in that um, age group, and uh, yeah, and I haven't challenged it too much. I just um, yeah, I haven't challenged it too much, but I kind of try. <laughs> not, 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 it's not, it hasn't been a big issue. Excellent. Um, I have just one more question from the chat. And mm -hmm. how do you decide what to add to a historical fiction piece? Mm -hmm. Well, you're creating a world, right? It's just like building a fantasy or you know, a sci-fi <coughs> novel or any, any novel. You know, you have to um, know what you're writing about, and so it took me a lot of research, um, which you can see right there. <laughs> that, that that's all my research on my website. If you scan that, it'll take you to that, and it 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 has you know books and films, videos, and whatnot. And so um, I sort of took lots of notes. And I, I assimilated all, I interviewed people, um, and I just was able to incorporate little by little um, the different um, details in a way that's, that felt natural versus um, something like, like um, didactic. Do you know what I mean? Like, so if, if, if they lived in Rusty Barracks, you know, she will notice the Rusty Barracks, if they lived with, you know, bed bugs, then, you know, the scene is about drowning bed bugs. If, um, if the children, you know, ch children were striking um, to free the mothers, then one of the characters had, I had to place the character as, as one of the children whose mother was in prison, and so that she could become part of the strike. And so, so you have to really work your characters into um, the history. I don't know 
hope that, <laughs> that answers the question. Yeah. So I remember in class earlier when we talked a bit about respecting a child's agency, and as part of that, a lot of your text seeks to empower children. Uh, and something I noticed in the reading tonight was the, dare I say, um, almost horrific moments within these plots that this can inhabit, uh, such as when the guns were drawn or when the father got angry. Yeah. Uh, even to the point where I, as a, like the semi-adult audience member, had a reaction to that. Mm -hmm. And so I was curious if you would be willing to talk about how to navigate those spaces, but with a child audience in mind. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I don't know if you remember being um, a child and, and the thrill of being scared. <laughs> you know, there's there's something about that. You know, so I think like any any person, uh, young or old, you know, there's something about the thrill of that. But um, but yeah, I, I it's really important for me to make sure that that um, these topics, these scary things are not left in a void that, you know, I've left you in a void in this reading, of course, right? But later, this little girl, you know, um, she comes back, right? Exactly. That, that's a beautiful way. Yeah, she comes back. In fact, um, let me see. There's, there's this, this, she says, um, oh, I'm not going to find it. But, but yeah, she, she, she says, you know, um, I'm not gonna find it, but basically she says, um, you know, oh here, I'm gonna read it to you. <laughs> we obey Papa. In the quiet, I am safe from Papa's winter because now spring opens into March. In the quiet, I count blessings with no room to be ungrateful, malcriadas. In the quiet, Mama doesn't have cancer, though she, she feels sick again. In the quiet, Concha will not leave any of us. In the quiet, Rafa went back to being a janitor. At least he has a job. In the quiet, the Alliance needs our help more than ever. In the quiet, Lenore and I sneak to pickets and rehearsals. That's what she's still doing. Mm -hmm. In the quiet, I don't have a voice, but I do. I do. And look at look at where I do is. Right? And these are the things that you can do with poetry, right? Like you just create all this white space around it. And um, it affirmed that she she has the power and she knows she does. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I mean, it's really important. I should have read that to, to make everybody feel better afterwards. But um, uh, but yeah, that's, that's such an important part of handling children's literature with care and this kind of unspoken Hippocratic oath to do no harm. To children. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it, the first piece you read, the Sinia piece, um, where the, the mother says the, the, the seeds hold power in their tiny form, they hold the memory of those who come before us. Yeah. And, and as you were reading that, I sort of thought, it's not just the seeds, it's the stories of the seeds, right? It's, and, the, and it's like the seeds are both words and stories, right? And that that is that kind of weaves through so much of the like um, botanical narrative here, right? The narrative of, of growth and, and ripeness, right? Yeah. Coming of age and coming to oneself. Mm -hmm. And also gets linked with her finding her voice, right? It, it, her voice goes and it comes back at the end. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. No, I, I, that, that again. That's that's the beautiful thing about poetry that you can mine all of these deeper metaphors and and there's space for it. Like in the moon within, it's all about the moon and about the different phases of them. The book is broken up into four phases, with the four major phases of the moon. Um, in Land of the Crane, the little girl believes she is a crane because the place, um, the, she believes a prophecy, which is that her people came from a place called Aslan. Aslan had been tra translated to Land of the Cranes. Mm -hmm. And so it's a metaphor that, that she could you know, fly free like a crane to migrate. They're one of the biggest migratory birds. 
and that one day um, the prophecy said they would go to Mexico and found a great city and come back to live among the cranes again. And it's, and it's so true. I mean, so many people are migrating back, right? So this was this, this metaphor that I was able to mine throughout the book about her believing she was a I, we're done there, it's fine. <laughs> um, um, you know, it was, it's, a, it's a metaphor, and, and the same with the seed. And, I, and, I, and to me, that's like so, um, it's so rich to be able to explore all of these elements of, of the seed and, and, and the possibility. There is this, this um, indigenous writer, her name is Rowan White, and I found her on Instagram. She's fabulous. She's so fabulous. And, and in fact, I quoted her here in one of the part openers. Um, and um, she talks about the power of seed and the power of story and, and, and how, um, you know, the, the, that we are seed keepers, right? We, as creatives, we are the ones who will, will continue the, those stories. Thank you. Thank you. Anything? I just want the book's just about to come out. It's just coming out, isn't it? What would happen if you like, there's a film of it? It just seems such a beautiful story that needs to be filmed. I mean, would you think would you write a screenplay, or would you? How do you feel about it <laughs> turned into a kind of Hollywoodization of or Disney Disney vacation? Mm. Well, you know what's so interesting? I have a friend who's a filmmaker, Akita Bach. He read it because uh, he was one of my sensitivity readers because he grew up next door to El Teatro Campesino, but he's he's Japanese American, and his family came they own farms in the area, and I interviewed him because I wanted to know what it was like to be an outsider mm. in El Teatro Campesino. But when he read the manuscript, he's like, this would make an amazing animated film, but not for children. It would be a great animated film for adults, and then he like turned me on to a whole world of like adult animated films, and I thought, wow, this is fantastic. So, um, of course, I'd be I'd be so happy for this to be. I have I know nothing about Hollywood. I know nothing about screenplaying. I I, I don't know anything about it, but but yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's a beauty. Like like Flea did very very well. Yeah, so many other animations. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering if you'd talk a little bit about your daily life as a writer, and sure. you, know, you have so many projects coming up, and do you like you know, dip in and out of things, or do you like do a whole week on one project, or how do you sort of structure your day? Oh, right. Um, well, I'm a full-time writer, so I don't do anything, but I'm also a full-time mom, and a full-time uh, uh, partner of a very successful musician, so I'm like, you know, juggling a lot and then I do a lot of activism on top of it um so uh I, my my children are at, at school between you know 8 and 4 30 and so I have to squeeze in the biggest <laughs> part of my writing day during that time and I will spend anywhere between one and two hours doing business which is really mm -hmm. you know not, not ideal but I try the most um to do that but I'll tell you, The Moon Within, I wrote in the spaces. Like, I was not a working, I mean, I had a part-time job, I was homeschooling, and I was, you know, there was a lot. And well, I took, I treated myself to a four-day retreat in Santa Cruz, and I went and got a bunch of food, and, and I didn't move for four days. And I came out with a manuscript. Mm -hmm. Yeah, four days. And I mean, I had the plot written out, and I had the, the story. But but yeah, I mean, it it it, it was that one, my one shot. <laughs> and Land of the Cranes, I did in about a month um, of of this kind of routine, and, and and that's kind of been the way that I try and structure it. Sometimes, like when when I'm on book tour or, or doing a lot of festivals and whatnot, um, I don't have time to write. And that's really upsetting. <laughs> like right now, like I need to finish this damn novel and it's really frustrating and I have really moments of hysteria, but you know, 
but 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 I but it's usually when a kid goes to school. Yes. Uh, right in this very room, there's a class that some of us are in called Translated Bodies. Oh. And so I'm especially interested to hear a little bit more about your relationship to translation. Mm -hmm. Both the fact that you yourself have translated work, but also your work has been translated. Oh yeah. And so I'm I'm really curious about how you found that divide, you know, mm -hmm. like, and also what kind of support or information, if any, did you give to the person who translated you? Okay, so right now it's kind of one of the things that I'm really kind of struggling with. So the first person to translate the Moon Within had very academic Spanish. Uh -huh. And this was a Chicana uh -huh. in Oakland. And, you know, there was no sense of Spanglish uh -huh. or bilingualism that, that was present in the original text um, when it got translated. So it was all Spanish. Mm -hmm. And certain words that are like Chicanismo, Chica they mm -hmm. wouldn't translate because it was going to the school market. Right. The reason why they're translating it is so that it could go to bilingual education programs. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that was really frustrating. And I did. I was a debut author, so I was like, "Yay, you get translating!" But I was like, "Who is this?" You mm -hmm. know, like very academic Spanish, and it just it wasn't like the swing of a kid in Oakland who says "hella." You know, like it was not there. So. Um, the second time around for Land of the Crane, I made sure that I tried to translate it. I I, I, I had to audition for my own book to translate my own book. Mm -hmm. And they told me no. They said no, we need it to be more formal Spanish again. And I was like, you know what? Fine, I've got a lot of work. It's fine. Because they also don't pay. Right. Yeah. They pay two thousand dollars to translate, you know, a whole novel. I mean, when I translated that novel from Span from the Spanish to English, that paid two thousand mm. dollars. It's like shameful, and I think I think it's like the standard rate, like uh, something ridiculous. Like that. Anyway, and um, and but I worked very closely. I said, you have to. Okay, if I can't do this, you have to let me work closely with it. And we we were went back and forth quite a bit. And I was very happy um, to to make that more more accurate. Um, when I translated from English to Spanish, those were poems. Both mm -hmm. of them were poems, and the reason why I was thought out as a translator was because of my my poetic you know career. So so like pa um, peace that book I had to translate in rhyme. In rhyme in Spanish, and and so that was a, a whole other level of, of of difficulty. And actually, Marielena helped me <laughs> that, that that quite a bit. And because it's a it's a different it's a different challenge. And so it wasn't just poetry; it was poetry and rhyme. And um and and but but people liked it, you know. So seemed to to um, like it. And then um the the and I and I'll say that that was illustrated by a Mexican illustrator who doesn't even live in the United States. She's in, in Mexico. And when she read the translation, she said this was the best translation ever. You know, because the, and so that for me was a sign of approval because um, it was it was a very Mexican uh, translation. And then um, the. The other, the when I translated from Spanish to English, that was so much easier, so much easier because English is my dominant language, and and I enjoyed that so much. And the the, the text that I translated is gorgeous, is so beautiful and and very unlike anything that's being published right now in U.S. literature, mm -hmm. children's literature. So. Um, but but there's a constant struggle with like this academic, you know, um, Spanish and and trying to to validate Chicana mm -hmm. Spanish, uh, Spanish is bio, uh, Spanglish, <laughs> you know that that um, so that's 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 a struggle. And but it's like you know, 
a, a deity or African American vernacular, mm -hmm. right? Like that is its own thing, and it so is you know Spanglish for for Chicano and, and Latino, U.S. Latino. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to make a comment. So, um, hi everybody. Um, <laughs> I just want to um, say, I just want to let you tell you a little bit about um, my appreciation for Aida. <laughs> We've been friends for a long time, and um, so she's told you a lot about her virus. But I really want to add something that was really impactful for me, and I think informs her her consciousness. Um, in the in the mid '90s, you will remember that the um, the indigenous people of the state of Chiapas in Mexico rebelled as Zapatista people, Zapatista and Zapatista people, and called themselves Zapatistas in the name of the, um, the Mexican um, revolutionary of the 1910s. And um, and uh, Aida was a leader at that time in Los Angeles, specifically in Highland Park, of a um, a space, uh, an independent cultural space where um, she and other leaders. Uh, inspired by the Zapatistas, created a, a space of where our activism and the arts were married. All, all the arts. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just want, I just want you to know that. About her. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, and you know, she, she created a space for so many of us to, to express our art completely freely. And um, I'll just mention that one, one in particular that was very um, impactful for so many of us was a, a, a night of. An all women, uh, you know, all genres of, of, of the art <clears throat> called Cappuccino War and Angel. Mm -hmm. um, that was really important for me, gave me a chance to, to do my first solo um, performance. And um, um, and I also wanted to, um, I don't know, I just really want you to know, like, that, that's probably, you know, that's where we first, when we first became fast friends and then, you know, again, kind of bonded through the, through the arts and through activism. But I also wanted to thank you, Aida, for starting your origin story as a writer with your uh, stories from your family, from you know the oral tradition in our families. And I, I have, I love that, and I love how you have. I'll, I'll say first that, you know, for, I think there are many cultures, perhaps I'm sure, share this. But I think Mexican culture, and I have been my experience. I share with Aida also coming from a migrant family, and actually none of my extended family moved here. So for us, Mexico City. And Hidalgo, where my mom is from, is you know is my second home. You know, we were coming back and forth. Fortunately, we did have legal status, and so every two years of my life, I was coming back and forth. And that's absolutely what you said. What I experienced growing up is that storytelling. You are, I mean, being a good conversationalist <laughs> and being able to tell a good story and especially a good joke is like you are gold. <laughs> you know, you are just like. You are just a, a treasured, highly honored person in the family. You know? So I just love how you have translated that and put it on the page. You know, that's what I'm like listening to you tell the story and you know having that experience growing up as you did. I'm like, that's what she did. Oh my God, she did it on the page too. You know? yeah. Anyway, I just had to share that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 We talked a little bit earlier in the in the classroom about about the. The, the concept of the culture of resistance and how that informs that's kind of like the backbone of of what I um, of my work in, in in all things and and when I write for adults or write for children and that that philosophy came from the Zapatistas most definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you so much, Happy It's such a pleasure to be here. Except for next door. We're going to try to stay masked and mm -hmm. work it. I think if you really want to like, eat, maybe go outside. <laughs> <laughs> We've never done this. A little corner. Yeah, a little corner. Where would you? Thank you all for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.